figure everything out. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service in Hernando County, and I'm here with our master gardener, Bernie, this morning. And hopefully you can see us and hear us okay, because we've been sitting here um, uh, playing with the uh, microphones and speakers and everything else. Bernie, can you hear me? I hear you fine. Okay, and I hear you fine too. So I guess we got everything fixed enough to carry on this morning. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll make it. Uh, with, this is what happens when there's more than one person using the desk. They they change settings that you don't expect. So <laughs> you, you've got an office. You get to sit in there, and, and everything's the same when you come in the next day. Uh, I never know. So <laughs> with that said, I think we're in good shape. Well, things get moved around my office sometimes. We do have office cleaners, and I'll come in, and things are in strange places. But um, generally, they don't mess with my computer too much, which is a good thing, because I just get thoroughly confused. So hey, guys, if anybody has any lawn and garden questions, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. And we will show them on the screen, and we'll do our best to figure it out and get you an answer. Good morning, Lee. How are you? So we have Buddy up in the Panhandle. We have Lee down in South Florida. We got the whole state pretty well covered here so far. And we have Monique in Brooksville. There so, we go. We've, we've got it. That's it. All three, all three zones now. There we go. So, Bernie, are you going to have uh, another session of Bernology this morning or this I'm afternoon? I'm going to talk about weed control uh, in okay. lawns. You know, it's, we've reached about the end of the time for uh, doing any weeding. If you go out much after this, you're going to start hurting the lawn. So we'll, we'll cover that and see if we can't keep people from uh, getting in trouble. Uh, understand that the, the county is... Uh, getting ready to uh, come up with some new fertilizer ordinances. Do you uh, have any later information on what's happening, Bill? Yes, I was at a meeting just the other day on that subject. Hernando County, like many other counties, has a fertilizer ordinance, and they're in the process of updating it and trying to figure out what to include, what to not include, the exact dates for when you're not allowed to fertilize, and it's up in the air, probably not for too long. My guess is within the next month or two, they're going to hammer it out and start actually having public hearings on it and voting on it. But you never know how these things are going to turn out. Um, in the not too distant future, we will have a new fertilizer ordinance to share with everybody so that you'll know how to fertilize your lawn properly and get good results and not get in trouble with code enforcement or the county or anybody else. So stay tuned. As soon as they change that, we'll have a, a lot of classes. We'll have a lot of materials on social media, kind of uh, educating people about that. And for Buddy and Lee, you guys can just ignore that because you don't live in Hernando County, but you probably do need to find out if your county has a fertilizer ordinance and if so, what it is. And a lot of counties do enforce it. You wouldn't want to get in trouble with anybody with the county, any authorities. Lee just got back from the Grand Canyon, and now she's dealing with dead plants down there in Broward County. That happens. You go on vacation, you come back, and it's like, ah, it didn't rain, or it rained too much, or my sprinklers broke or my hose broke or something, it seems like something always happens. Or your neighbor got even, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> that could happen action. too. <laughs> yeah, Lee, I'm sure that you have some kind of fertilizer ordinance in Broward. I have no idea the um, fine points. You know, the state of Florida has a very, very basic um, model fertilizer ordinance which doesn't control a lot, controls a little bit. And that's kind of the, the basic that every county who has to have one has to implement. 
but it seems like every county has slightly different rules when it comes to how close to a waterway can you fertilize? When can you fertilize? When are you not allowed to fertilize? Um, how do they deal with professional fertilization companies? So every county is different, and I, you know, encourage everybody to check with your county to find out what the details are in your county, because I can almost guarantee you they're different from here. Well, that's that's one of those things. Basically, uh, it depends on where you are in the state as as to wind and uh, how much fertilizer you can apply, and and that you know it it's very difficult to have a, a set of laws that cover the entire state when uh, there's probably seven or eight legitimate different ways that need to be taken into consideration uh, for the for the whole state. You you know if you're down south and and uh, you're in an area where there's a lot of waterways and uh, you, you really have to be careful. Uh, very little fertilizer application is needed and and people tend to. Uh, use too much at the wrong time on just about any product that there is. So, and yeah, you get up north, uh, there's no waterways, and and uh, uh, if, if you don't fertilize as often, uh, or you fertilize a little more than than maybe you could get by with uh, here, uh, that's not as big a problem. So, you you know, you have to take the locality into consideration, and. Uh, the growing season is different in different parts of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, down south, it grows continuously. Up north, uh, the uh, grass is only growing, what, seven months out of the year. Yeah, good point, because I know in South Florida, St. Augustine grass will grow pretty much year round. So you're gonna have to follow a different fertilizer schedule than we do right here in Hernando County. In Central Florida, because our grass doesn't grow for a couple months during the winter. And there's no point fertilizing it because your grass is not going to take the fertilizer up. You're wasting your time, your money. Fertilizer is going to go somewhere, usually in the groundwater or in a waterway. And then in North Florida, they have an even longer, colder winter. So they're going to be fertilizing different times of the year. So you have to look at, so the, the the ordinances are written depending on local conditions, whether you're on the coast, North Florida, South Florida, wherever. And you also have to realize that the, there's some commercial interests that uh, are pushing on one side to uh, have the, the laws written in one direction and some homeowners uh, with slightly different interests that, that want things slightly different. So uh, I, I don't know about uh, how, how good our people are in the county at, at these technical things. But I'm, I'm sure that uh, it, it's a tough decision to satisfy all interests and yet still have a bill that, that works fairly. So uh, give them some time. I'm sure they'll do it. Yeah, these things are always a compromise because uh, fertilizer ordinance, you know, my yard is different from your yard, which is different from somebody that lives right on the Wikiwachi River. We all have different situations and conditions. You really can't have a one size fits all perfectly kind of um, ordinance. So, so we have a lot. Of, we'll have more details as they come up. We do have a lot of population that uh, comes from places where fertilizer ordinances aren't necessary. So uh, they they don't understand why we even bother to have them. So uh, yeah. Yep. And in fact, they don't even understand why they can't grow Kentucky bluegrass here. If if we had a Kentucky blue that would work, we'd be billionaires, you know what? <laughs> or a nice fescue like they had in Indiana. Yeah. And we don't have watering restrictions in Michigan. Why can't I water whenever I want to here in Central Florida? So we hear it all. We hear a lot of that. Yeah. But I, I knew that you just take a handful of grass seed and you throw it on a lawn and, and three weeks later you start mowing it. That's that's the way it was in Indiana. And I was really stunned to find out that grass doesn't work that way here, just like everybody else. <laughs> yes, the rules are different here in Florida. 
And sometimes you have to remind people, um, you live in Florida now. Nobody cares about your lawn in Indiana or Michigan or wherever it might be. Rules are different here. Well, you can't grow a pine tree in New Jersey and you can't grow grass in Florida. So mm -hmm. pretty much the way it is. We, we're, we're making something happen here that happens no place else on, on earth at, at our latitude. So uh, I think we're doing pretty good. It, uh, the grasses look green and, and uh, they, they may not be the, the lush, beautiful thing we had up north, but they're good. And, and uh, we're still working on, you know, the, the grasses up north were, were developed three to 4,000 years ago in Europe. And, and all those grasses came from somewhere else. And, and the grasses in Florida weren't even here until they put the railroad in and, and people got off the railroad and said, my God, there's no grass. We need grass. Yeah. Where's so, the lawn? Yeah. So the university started, they, they've had basically a little over 150 years to do what uh, the northerners have, have done in 3000 years. So I figure you give the university a couple of hundred more years, we'll have just as pretty grass as any place on earth. <laughs> uh, but don't hold me to that. Yeah, they'll figure it out eventually. They're always researching new grasses coming out with, um, they've come out with quite a few new named varieties of Bermuda over the last couple of years. And there's more varieties of Zoysia. But Zoysia, very few people grow it here in Hernando. Very, very difficult to manage. You have to know what you're doing. And most people don't like Bermuda for turf grass. Well, it's, it makes a good golf course. It, the, yeah. the advantage to, to Bermuda is that it's, it's one grass that you can mow at three eighths of an inch and, and it still stays alive. Now you have to water it every day. You have to really have somebody take care of it that, that knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. but. That's what makes golf courses possible in Florida. So, wonder if you could have uh, putting greens with uh, AstroTurf. You know, I was visiting our kids in Miami a while back, and his next and in his neighborhood, they had tiny their houses. They're not duplexes or apartments, houses, but a tiny front yard and a tiny backyard. His neighbor had a tiny front yard, fenced in with a little white picket fence, and AstroTurf. And I walked by, I kind of looked at it, I thought, it works. It looked pretty good, and it was practical. You know, technically not Florida-friendly. <laughs> I don't think they recommend AstroTurf. But for them, they only had a tiny, tiny little area where they could put it down anyway. They put it down, and I guess that was for the dogs. To be on or something i'm seem to work to me don't have to fertilize it don't have to water it low maintenance but but sam and i think he lives over in volusia county so so very equivalent to us his lawn is full of weeds what is your recommendation and what to do to have a beautiful lawn free from weeds what would you recommend for him well, the first thing you need to know is what type of grass you have, because the, the program is not the same for uh, all the, the different grasses. Mm -hmm. and, and second, you have to realize that it takes time to, to get rid of the weeds. Uh, you're, you're embarking on probably a minimum of three year program that has to be strictly adhered to. And it, and it has to do with the fact that there, there are seeds that, that are producing these things. And, and even if you have a, a very effective pre-emergent to stop those seeds from germinating, you know, if you've got a, a million seeds per square yard, which is not unrealistic, if you're 90% effective the first year, you've still got 100,000 seeds. Uh, and then the, the second year, you've got 10,000 seeds that... that have the potential of germinating. So uh, it, it takes a, a, a concentrated effort uh, and it only works up until the temperatures get high. And, and once the daytime temperature is above 85 degrees, 
you really should stop doing any weed control until it cools down. During the, those hot periods, the, the only good weed control is go out and pull them yourself. So uh, you need to get with somebody in an extension office, set up a program, stick to it, make make sure that you really follow it. it it's it, it's custom to each individual lawn, and uh, uh, unfortunately, it's hard to get it done commercially because uh, the commercial people pretty much tend to follow the one size fits all, and uh, yeah, yeah, and that that becomes uh, a, a real problem. So, lawn control is is, is something that uh, you either spend a tremendous amount of money to get somebody that, that's really good, or or you expend some effort and, and do it yourself. And I I think people should should learn to uh, go out, walk around, and look and see what's actually going on. And if you don't understand what you see, get in touch with somebody that, that does. And, and and that goes for all your landscaping plants. It saves you a lot of money in the long run. And and it, if you've just moved here, uh, I'm sure that, that you're not familiar with the way the southern plants need to be taken care of. People who lived here for uh, 40, 30, 40 years, they understand uh They've, they've seen enough fungal problems, bought enough replacement plants that they're starting to, to understand it. But but the newcomers especially really do need to talk to an extension agent or uh, local university or some, somebody that, that understands what's going on in their locality. So that's my pitch. Oh, yeah. And I know with weed control, timing is very important also because, like, for example, uh, a summertime we would be like southern sandspur and everybody calls us in august and september when you really notice them because you walk in your yard you take your dog out and you step on a sandspur you're going to feel it but the time to control them isn't august or september too late then you have to go back and around february put down a pre-emergence so that ideally most of it won't come up and then stick stay on top of it right after it comes up so controlling weeds at the right time of year, taking care of them early, goes a long way towards eventually getting control. But there is there is no silver bullet. There is no one product that you can go out there and spray once and boom, all your problems are solved. Doesn't work like that. Not quite that easy. Yeah, even Roundup won't kill everything. So uh, a, yeah. a really cute trick for the uh, sand spurs is when you start seeing the sand spurs, you get an old piece of carpet and you drag it around on the lawn and pick up the spurs. So you get rid of the seeds that helps reduce the, the sand spurs the next year. Yeah, that really does help. Or if you walk around the yard barefoot enough, you'll find all the sand Yeah, that'll get them. Do that. That'll work. <laughs> so we had a question from Corey about what am I planting this week? Most every, everything for spring is planted and whatever I didn't plant for spring, it's too late. <laughs> spring is just about gone really at this point. One thing that I do need to get planted that I'm gonna try this year is um, a variety of pumpkin that was developed by University of Georgia. I believe it's called Orange Bulldog and it's supposed to grow very well in the heat of summer. It's a slightly different type of summer squash because, you know, pumpkins are summer squash. And they have very good success with it growing in the heat of summer up in Georgia. I'm going to try it here, and hopefully it's disease resistant. Hopefully my neighborhood animals won't disturb it or get into it. We'll find out. And hopefully I don't have too many caterpillar problems because I'm always really slow at getting out there and spraying and controlling them. I'll get to it eventually, but not immediately like you should. So I'm going to give that a try. Obviously, I'll keep, you know, on the plant clinic and on Facebook, I'll make posts, let everybody know how well it works. Grew great, grew terrible, got a lot of pumpkins off of it, didn't get any pumpkins off of it. I'll share that. But it is something, I was given a packet of seeds at a um, conference in Georgia last year. So I thought, hmm. I'll give it a try. It's supposed to work well. University of Georgia is okay. I'm sure they develop good vegetables too. It doesn't have to be University of Florida. 
Well, that's true. Yeah. You know, Georgia actually does a, a lot of research in what I would consider poor soil commercial farming. And mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're probably one of the best states in, in the country for doing that. Uh, a pasture on, on land that doesn't produce anything. They've actually come up with some, some pasture grasses that, that will grow under just about any condition. And uh, they're, they're the leader of, the, of that type of research, which because they're next door to us, it, it's made it possible for us to use some of their technology uh, in doing long grass research here. Yeah. Just drive up I-75. You're going to pass through the town of Tifton. And that's where they have the research center where they develop all the uh, Bermuda grasses. Tifton this and Tifton that and Tif Tough. And they do a lot of turf grass work up there. Yeah, Tifton 241 and... I like it. That that you know it nails it down to where it came from. So when yep. when these farmers there is a town by, of Tifton. Yeah. I've stayed yeah. there before. And they grow really good peaches in that area too. You know, we grow good peaches here. How long do yeah. cucumber plants last aside from fungal issues? They produce until the plants don't produce anymore. <laughs> When 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 the plants give up, you give up. But you know, it's, it, it's like all these things. Tomatoes, when they quit producing, they're done. You know, so and and cucumbers are the same way. So when you can't get any more cucumbers, that that's that's when you get rid of the plant. Yeah, and that's generally going to happen by June first to June fifteenth, kind of. Yeah. A because by then spring is gone definitely summer yeah it depends on how hot it gets we've we've had some uh, seasons where we're actually able to keep tomatoes uh, almost all the way through june but uh, it's been a while since that happened yeah i know um i can't remember where i encountered this but there are people and i've heard of somebody who's very, you know, backyard gardener who is very close to getting the timing and varieties down where he had tomatoes year round. Because you can grow tomatoes over the winter, you have to make sure they don't freeze. And there are cold tolerant tomatoes, they, they, they bloom and they set fruit in cooler temperatures, kind of designed for early spring planting up north, but they work in Florida in the winter. And there are some slightly more heat tolerant varieties and types. So I'm going to start working on that. I'm going to sit down and try to figure out what to plant when and bring into production over these couple months, then these couple months, then these couple months, and see if I can't have different varieties just about year round because they're better than grocery store tomatoes. It, it, it's really an interesting thing. If, if you live up north, the easiest plant to grow is tomatoes. I mean that, and and you just take your salt shaker and walk out through the tomato plants, and and come back with your face all covered and your fingers all dripping with tomato juice, and I remember that as a kid. That was the yep. easiest thing going. And in Florida, tomatoes. You know, if, if if you get really good tomato crop three out of five years, you're a pretty darn decent gardener. That that is not the world's easiest plant. By the way, is is BT uh, considered acceptable uh, in organic gardening? Yes. So I, I can recommend BT to these people that want to stay organic. Yes. Technically, if it is a brand of BT where it's from GMO bacteria, then it's not organic. But I don't know of anybody who has GMO bacteria. So I'm not sure if that's even a, a relevant point, really. Okay. But yeah, that's one of the things we ought to cover. organic production. Uh, you know, caterpillars react very well to BT. It's a, it's a great product for controlled caterpillars. And uh, for some reason, as soon as people see a caterpillar, 
uh, they they want a sledgehammer. The next thing you know, they're spraying seven or malathion on plants that really shouldn't shouldn't be treated that way. So, if if BT is acceptable and, and you can still call it organic, uh, yep. BT should should be a lot heavier used than it is. And if you only have one caterpillar or two, just pick them all. Sure, like Buddy asks here, what did you throw over the fence? Just throw the yeah. caterpillar over the fence. Because I'm lazy. I'm not going to go to the time and trouble to go in the garage and pull out the BT or spin a sad, mix it up, get the sprayer. If I have a lot of plants and a lot of caterpillars, I'll do that. If I just have one tomato hornworm that I find, it's going over the fence. Boom, 30 seconds, and we're all done. Moving on. Yeah, I've got a lot of uh, orange trees, and I'll find an orange dog every once in a while, and I'll just move it from a little tree to a big tree and not worry yeah. about them. I like the butterflies. They're pretty. Yeah, and you usually don't have too many of them, and each one doesn't do a huge amount of damage. You know, obviously, if it's a, just a little tiny brand-new small tree, it's going to do more damage. Yeah, you lose about four or five leaves, it seems like, and that, that's not much. Yeah, they don't leave very much. So, yes, Monique, green beans are going to wrap it up about June 1st to June 15th also. I usually get, like, two flushes of green beans. So you plant them, they come up, they grow, they flower. You get green beans, you pick them, you fertilize them just a little bit and water them, and they'll flush out and flower again, and you'll get more beans. And that's usually about it. Although if you grow a bunch of green beans and they do well, you can pick a bunch of green beans off of not that many plants. And Buddy mentions that the Everglade tomatoes do well in hot weather. That's like a... Um, a certain type of tomato, uh, tomato relative. Um, they look like cherry tomatoes, a little bit smaller. I think they're kind of sour. Honestly, not my favorite tomato. But they do grow in very hot weather. They tend to be more uh, disease resistant, although not completely. They're not going to crash and burn and die quickly like... Um, Big Boys and Abraham Lincoln and all the different very, very large varieties. I know a lot of people that grow them, and they do well in the summer. And Corey points out he has a friend that grows beans all year, growing, going between bush beans. They grow well at the right time of year, pole beans, and Asian long beans, as well as snap beans. I've grown Asian long beans before. You ever had them, Bernie? No, I don't think so. I'm not a big fan of green beans. That's something soup my wife loves, and I don't really care that much for. And I yeah, my wife, she, green beans are pretty much one of her favorites. But Asian long beans is a uh, tropical variety of beans, so they do well here in the heat of summer. You can plant them right now. They're going to grow all summer, and they get... The, the beans aren't a yard long. They're not three feet long. They're maybe a foot long and very skinny. And they kind of curve and twist a little bit. They're tasty. They're very good. Like I said, I've grown them successfully before. For some reason, aphids absolutely adore Asian long beans. And if you grow them, you will get tons and tons of aphids. So have the insecticidal soap ready for them. And know that aphids are coming if you try growing them. I need to plant some this summer, I think. And yeah, Lee says even down in Broward County, Everglades tomatoes grow great down there. And she also grows the Asian long beans there during the summer. <coughs> yeah, they are, they're very heat tolerant. It's one of the few things that doesn't mind the heat. And, yep, I've never seen so many aphids in my life, except when I grew the Asian yard-long beans. And I grew black-eyed peas once before. And, oh, my God, the plants were completely covered with aphids. I couldn't get rid of them. But I still got a really good crop out of them. Um, black-eyed peas are not that hard to grow, really. 
that's kind of like the, the symbol of the South. Yeah. Yeah. And okra grows well also, but what feeds on okra? What's going to be your biggest problem? Do you know? No. Nematodes. Nematodes love okra. If you have root knot nematodes in your garden, they will kill your okra quickly. And you'll go and you'll pull the plant. Oh my gosh, what's wrong with these plants? You'll pull the plant up and it's, it looks like a pencil. There's no roots. I mean, the roots are, are completely gone. So that's, that's the only what point. happens when I try and grow figs. The, the plants just get smaller every year till they get down to where they're about a foot tall. And they, yeah. they, they don't totally die, but they just never thrive, never take off. And uh, I had that problem with pomegranate. So, kind of surprised me. I figured pomegranates being from somewhere so far away would do pretty well. But uh, the, the, whatever nematodes I've got, like them. Yeah, and there's a bunch of different species of nematodes and you would have to send a sample off to Gainesville to University of Florida to have them count the nematodes and tell you if the ones you have are a problem for what you're trying to grow. Yeah, I got to go up and watch them do that. That That is a, a fun thing. They, they centrifuge everything and uh, run it through a coffee filter and the uh, nematodes go through the coffee filters. <laughs> So Corey says, yeah, um, on a small garden scale, good to keep those kind of plants going. So the predators always have something to eat after a year or so doing it. The pest predator relationship or balance kind of gets cooking and settles down some. There are plenty of beneficial insects out there that eat aphids. But for some reason, yard long beans and black eyed peas are like crack for aphids. One of their favorites. You know that what she says about the the predator prey relationship is so true. People go in and, and spray constantly, and they they zap everything. And then once you do that, you have to keep spraying continuously because all the good guys are gone. Yep. And then if you go on vacation for a few weeks, you come back to dead plants. <laughs> in this off waterfall. You know, uh, uh, fig trees do really well in some areas. So they, we had uh, some at the, uh, where the, the nursery is now, the Master Gardener Nursery, and, yep. and they did quite well. Uh, figs, for the most part, do good here. Um, uh, brown turkey and Celeste both uh, are, are pretty common. And uh, it's, it's the land that was an old orange grove which we've got quite a few of those in the eastern part of the county that have really super high nematode counts. So uh, if you really want a garden, probably an old citrus nursery is not a good place to be. But yeah, we do have some figs in the area that do well. And certain varieties of figs can very easily be planted in a large container and grown that way also. And they're really good. I, I think yeah. the local figs do very well. Things are great. Yeah, very good for you, too. So, hey, guys, if we have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the comments. And we will do our best to answer them. One thing I did want to mention for residents of Hernando County and surrounding counties and any part of Florida where it's been unusually dry this spring, we will probably, and I don't know this for sure, and it may not happen, but my guess is we're gonna have more um, bark beetle problems with pine trees. Because even though we have a huge number of species of different bark beetles, a lot of them are natives, a lot are invasive. They attack a wide variety of trees. Most common ones that we see outbreaks of are ones that attack pine trees. And by the time you notice it on your pine tree, it's too late. 
and there's not a whole lot you could so i mean bernie there's no spray or anything you could do to keep them away so if you live well, on the there it's for we need a systemic for them you can there are systemics there are injectables technically also that aren't widely used here in florida because it's a lot of work a lot of expense they're just pine trees obviously if you had um a piece of property where you're growing an acre or five acres of pine trees very difficult and expensive to go out there and inject all of them so people don't generally do that very often but if any of you have a suburban yard or maybe your piece of property and next door is a wooded area a lot of pine trees we may be seeing a lot more dead pine trees this year than we did last year i can't remember any bark beetle problems last year Can no we? i didn't didn't have a soul to talk about it yeah we either have a lot of problems with it or none we've we've had probably three major outbreaks in the past 15 years we had one that was really, really severe. I mean, we uh, uh, we have a lot of pine trees here. I mean, you know, the people took out uh, citrus in the 80s and put pine in so they could maintain the green belt. Yeah. And, and those trees uh, were not quite ready to be harvested. And boy, did they get hit. We, we lost a, a lot of trees. Um, I think it's about eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, and uh, and then before that, the the last super major outbreak we had was when we had the forest fires. It must have been uh, about two thousand one, someplace in there. Uh, we had half the state was burning. There were there were fires everywhere, and yeah. the beetles were really active. So. Fortunately, uh, we haven't had those kind of conditions. And, and I think that it starts raining, we'll probably have uh, about an average year again with water, even though we're way behind right now. Yeah, because um, either really wet winters or springs or really dry ones tend to stress out a lot of pine trees. And you'll have... Um, just really localized outbreaks. I know just a few years ago, we had um outbreak of the native Ips beetles here and in a certain, certain areas over along State Road 19, around Wikiwachi, we had neighborhoods and areas and subdivisions where they had a lot of dead trees, but it wasn't extremely widespread. So just wanted to throw yeah, something out there track. for people to be on the lookout for. Big pine track, uh lost a, a lot of the uh, legacy pine trees so uh, we, we went on a night walk and you could just stand there and hear the beetles munching away in the trees it, it it's amazing how much sound there is at night just because yep. it's all quiet so uh, they they are a noisy bug so Monique points out that imidacloprid is a systemic that works well on beetles. I don't know if that's labeled for pine trees or not. That is labeled for a lot of um, ornamental plants. And it works on bark beetles, should work on ambrosia beetles, and definitely works on piercing, sucking insects, aphids, mealybugs, things like that. Yeah, I, I like a metacloprid. That, that's a good product. Yeah. But you want to use it on plants that don't flower or use it at a time when there's no bees because plants that have that are flowering that have been treated with metacloprid kill by bees. Yeah, it probably has a special bee label on it too. So always read all the label, all the directions, so that you know how to use it safely and not, you know, damage bee populations. Lee. How big a pot do you oh. use for plant? For growing okra in pot? Yeah. Uh, all, uh, it all depends. You could use uh you could use just a three gallon pot. 
and grow maybe three okra plants in it. Obviously, the bigger the pot, the more okra you can grow in it. I tried doing that once, and it was in really, really difficult to keep them watered enough. When they started growing and got fairly large, I'm watering the pot like once or twice a day, and it'd just be bone dry within an hour or two or three. It's really hard to keep enough water on it. I might have to try that again, though. I like okra. I do, too. No, I like it. But I, would, I would think a five-gallon pail would be about the smallest to, to successfully grow okra really yeah. well. They get, they get large. I, I've seen pictures of okra plants that would get six feet tall. Yeah. But they didn't have nematodes. <sighs> And Marie has a question for you, and I believe she's up in northern Florida, southern Georgia, somewhere up there north of us. So what types of figs do you grow? I have a few variety, few varieties. My strawberry figs do very well. They make fabulous jam. Can't seem to get others to produce yet. Fingers crossed. Maybe they're still too young. So any advice on figs, how old they have to be to get figs? Well... They, they should start producing in the second year and be actually uh, a legitimate producer in the third or fourth year. And uh, in, in this area around here, the, the most common are either Celeste or Brown Turkey. So. I know University of Florida has a fact sheet with the different varieties of figs that grow in Florida. Teresa's not on today. That's why you notice that we don't have any links for anything that we mentioned. As soon as we start talking about something, Teresa's looking it up and sharing the link. But, Anne-Marie, you could try looking online. Look under University of Florida Figs. They should have a fact sheet for um, here. Why don't I quit being so lazy and look it up myself? So if we look up University of Florida figs, a lot of good information on here. Um, I see blog posts from the UF Extension um, Office in Santa Rosa County, one from Escambia County. They're both up in northern Florida. But here is a publication on the fig. And boom, there's a link to uh, University of Florida Fig Fact Sheets that tells you just all the basics about figs. A little bit of history. I'm not sure if that includes recommended varieties. It includes the history of fig cultivation. We've been growing them for thousands of years. Go all the way back to the Old Testament. They're all eating figs back then. Uh, fruit morphology. Um, oh, yeah, they have a lot of information about, wow, there's a lot of different cultivars of figs. Alma, Black Spanish, Brown Turkey, Celeste Champagne, Canadria, Green Ischia. Wow, a lot of different types here. Uh, you can do hardwood cutting propagation off of figs. So if you have a fig, you could take hardwood cuttings and root them. So, yeah, lots of great information there. Learn more about figs and we can all grow some. Oh, Lee suggests grow the short okra plants. I know there's a couple different varieties of okra. There's not a huge number. But there are some varieties that get bigger and other ones that are more dwarf. So that would do. Um, but Sam is growing black sesame seeds with great success. Huh. I'll have to try that. 
we love sesame seeds when I make Asian dinner. So very, very important. Okay, here's a poster and I don't recognize the name. So if you're brand new, welcome. If you've just been lurking, shame on you. You should have asked a question long ago, but that's okay. Kelsey asks, any advice on fixing contaminated soil? I believe the topsoil we bought in bulk was infected with some type of herbicide. All my tomato and pepper plants got curly leaf. Bernie, any advice on that? You know, the thing about it is in two years, everything that was in that topsoil is going to be gone. So uh, you, you'll find that uh, there really isn't much you can do for the soil but the soil is going to clean itself. It did. Uh, the, the second year you plant in it, it's going to be better. Uh, the, the third year, it should be back to normal. Uh, yeah. and that's assuming that you're in this part of Florida. The farther north you are, the longer it takes for that to happen. But uh, in our part of Florida, uh, all those uh, organic materials, all that stuff pretty much uh, leaches out in two years. Yeah, every herbicide breaks down eventually. There are certain herbicides that they use in hay production. And they, they're they growing the hay, they spray the herbicide to kill the weeds, and then the cows eat the grass, and they the cows poop, and the chemical is still active towards plants. So if you use that cow manure in your garden, plants are going to die. Um, if you use the manure and they composted it and any of it went in topsoil, it stays active, but not forever. Within about a year or two, it does completely break down. You're not going to have that problem. So difficult. There's no easy soil test. You know, before you ask, well, can you test for it? You have to know what you're looking for. And there's a million different chemicals that it could be. And it can be very, very expensive to try to test for all of them. We had them. Uh... This, this comes up every once in a while in, in legal battles. Uh, people want to know if, if the neighbor did something to kill their plant. And, yeah. and that kind of soil test starts at about 3,000 and goes up. So um, generally... And doesn't test for everything. And no, and, and, and so once they know that uh, it's going to cost them at least 3,000 to find out if there was something, maybe as much as a fifteen or twenty thousand, uh, if you go through the whole whole spectrum, uh, you know, the, the the they run those tests and and they uh, get a graph that's got little little lines on it, little little up and down wigglies, and then they start running known things through to see if the wigglies compare, mm -hmm. and and so. You say, well, was it glyphosate? Well, you run glyphosate and you compare it to the Wigglies and no, it wasn't that. Okay, now, uh, was it 2,4-D? And you run 2,4-D and, and no, it's not that. And and they can tell eventually, you know, what kind of family we're looking at, but maybe there's 60 chemicals in that family. They can run that test 60 times and, and you're paying uh, 600 bucks a, a test when every time it goes into the column, uh, you know, it doesn't take long and, and you got to really think and be sure that, that somebody did something if you need to know that. Yeah. Cor well, Corey points out that the sum will eventually break it down or it'll wash into the aquifer, which we don't really want to see, but it happens. Um, you could try taking some of the soil and trying to just kind of test germinate some seeds in it. Lettuce works well. If you take that soil and you try germinating just a, you know, a dozen green bean seeds and corn seeds, that would be a good test to make sure that you don't have any herbicide residues in it because beans are a broadleaf plant and corn is technically a grass because there are herbicides that kill grasses but not broadleaves lots of herbicides that kill broadleaves but not grasses so that way you kind of cover both areas 
and you could test your soil before you go out there and invest in a lot of seeds and put them in your garden and they don't come up. So there were problems with that uh, contaminated manure slash contaminated compost for a while. And you can still, if you like to go and get a bale of hay to mulch your vegetable garden with, if it's contaminated with that herbicide, it will start to damage your plants after you put it down. And you're going to have to pull it up real quick. So best way around, you can't always go to like the feed store and say, hey, you know, what kind of herbicides did you use growing this hay? They'll be like, I didn't grow the hay. I just bought it. I don't know what's in it. You know, buy it or don't buy it. So it's a little difficult to tell if you deal with somebody who you know and are able to ask them what did they use when they were in the process of growing that hay, that's going to be a lot safer. So, you know, we never did. We never mentioned Lily today, did we? Where is Lily? Yeah, where is Lily? <laughs> Lily's on vacation. She's up north, I believe, in the Virginia area. I've seen some pictures. They're up there in their camper. She might be watching today. I'm not really sure. She hasn't piped up yet if she is watching. So well, she would commented that she would uh, uh, maybe show up. So yeah, well, I, she I did. She would have showed up by now if she was going to. I'm not even sure when she's getting back, but hopefully it's soon because next Thursday I will be at a conference in Gainesville. I'd rather be here, but I'll have to be there. So, Bernie, I think it's going to be you and Lily next week. But if you have any questions for Lily, there is her email. Please be sure to send the really, really difficult questions to her. If she doesn't like them, she'll forward them to me, and then we'll pass them around. We'll, we'll, we'll answer it eventually. Um, you're always free to shoot me an email if you have a question. Try to take lots of pictures. I try to tell people there's no such thing as too many pictures. Good, plentiful pictures help us figure out what's wrong and what to recommend. Um, call the office. Not right now. Wait another hour or two till Teresa gets back so that she can answer your questions. You're probably thinking, how do I get my questions answered? It sounds like you guys just pass them around there, but no, we, we, we get to the questions. If you email me, it may take me one, two, three days to get back to you with an answer, but we'll get back to you. As always, follow us on our Facebook page. If you go to Facebook, our short name is Hernando EXT, and everything we have coming up, we put on there. As a matter of fact, uh, in an hour or so, I'm going to schedule next week's virtual plant clinic. It's going to be there on Facebook for you to find the link. Or if you go to the web address scrolling along the very bottom there, HernandoExtension.com, you'll find information there of all of our upcoming classes. Mine, Lily's, our bosses, Jim Davis's Natural Resources, hikes that we do he's on a hike right now with Teresa and a bunch of people so everything you need to know about that is right there and last but not least for local residents please stop by our master garden nursery located on oliver street in brooksville that is right behind the hernando county fairgrounds right along state road 41. they are there wednesday morning and saturday morning from 8.30 until noon, although they're going to start closing at 11 a.m. soon because it's getting hot. And when it gets really hot, they send me an email that says, we're going to start closing at 11 because it's just getting too hot. Okay, I'll go back in and change the hours in the newsletter and everywhere else. So, so they're there till 11. After that, I can't really make any guarantees. So let's see what kind of final comments we have. Kelsey, you are very welcome. 
Corey, you are correct. I think we did mention poop today. So even though Lily wasn't here, we did cover the important <laughs> basics of poo. Lee, thank you so much for always tuning in. Cindy, thank you also. And Monique and all of our regulars, thank you all so much for tuning in. You know, without you, you guys, I wouldn't even do this. I'd be, you know what I'd be doing? I'd be stuck doing paperwork. And I'd be really unhappy about it because I don't like paperwork. So I'd be doing that instead of doing this. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you keep showing up, we'll keep showing up. Bernie, you're going to keep showing up? Well, I've done it for 15 years and missed about eight weeks in 15 years. So During COVID, so you had a good excuse. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm, by the way, I'm a, a, the lawn expert, so... Uh, if, if your questions particularly are on lawns and you really want to spend some time, a uh, long conversation, uh, call on a Thursday with the exception of this 10 to 11 time. And uh, we'll go through it and see if we can't solve your problem. We're really pretty good at that. And if, if we can't do it here, we've got some pretty good backing at the university. So uh, love to hear from you. With that said, Thanks a lot for the, inviting me to be on this today, Bill. Thank you for joining us. And there's the phone number to our office. Once again, if you call here during the day on Thursday, they'll go ahead and patch you through to Bernie. You can have a nice long chat with them on the phone. Or if you live closer to the office, feel free to stop by in person, bring in turf grass samples, plant leaves, whatever you got. And we'll figure out exactly what's wrong. So a couple more wonderful comments here. And you know what, guys? We eat this kind of stuff up. I know I do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, everyone. We Somebody will be here next Thursday at 10 a.m. Should be Lily and Bernie. So tune in then and bring all your questions all your pictures, your uh, comments on poo and everything else that we need to cover. And we will see you again next week. So until then, bye guys.